We were walking along the Fashur, a broad avenue lined with wild chestnut trees near the city park. My mother and I walked hand in hand under the lush green trees decked out in their festive spring finery, white and pink blossom clusters that looked like miniature Christmas trees. It was a street I knew well. In a few weeks, the blossoms would drift to the sidewalk to create a soft pink carpet, which I loved to shuffle in. Later, the flowers would be replaced by round, spiky green pods that weighed down the branches until early fall, when they too dropped to the pavement and released shiny mahogany chestnuts. But there would be no wild chestnuts for me in the fall. It was April 1944 in Budapest. The German army had taken over Hungary. I was seven years old. It was quite warm for April, not unusual to want to walk coatless in the sun. Those who saw us would not guess that this was a dangerous thing to do. The coat, so casually turned inside out, bore the compulsory yellow cloth Star of David sewn onto all our outer clothing, branding, branding as us Jews. Jews. Why should I hide the star? I'm proud to be Jewish, I had announced, ignorant of the ominous implications of being seen in the street with the telltale star. How had my parents impressed upon me the importance of denying my identity? I had always liked to play make-believe, but somehow they made me understand that this game was real. In fact, I wanted so desperately to believe that I was this other, more desirable child that I don't recall longing for my parents. Eventually, I believed that they and the past we had shared were objectionable, shameful, and even worse, a sin. On the day my mother and I arrived at the Ursuline mother house, a strange woman in a black, black floor-length floor gown opened the gate. It was the first time I had ever seen a nun this close up. My stomach seemed to constrict around a pebble I had not swallowed. She must have smiled as her hands escaped from the full sleeves of her ample dress to reach for mine. Because when I followed her along the path towards the yellow stucco two-story villa, that pebble in my middle began to dissolve. As I walked under the sweet-scented linden trees, my bare feet welcomed each painful pebble. I mumbled the recently learned Ave Maria, fingering my rosary, the tiny white beads ending in a silver crucifix. I was good at make-believe, so good that I had made my previous Jewish self fade, receding into the forbidden recesses of my mind. I was voluntarily doing penance for the sins of the previous week, like the martyred saints. Not the lie about who I really was, but others, more in keeping with my current beliefs. Ouch! A pointed red pebble nearly pierced the tender sole of my city bred foot. I welcomed the pain, proof of my sacrifice. Ave Maria, I recited fervently. Ouch! Again, I fingered the next bead. Serves me right. Ave. I'm Judy Abrams. I have just been fortunate enough to have my story published by the Israeli Foundation. This story, called Tenuous Threads, is published in the same volume as Eva Felsenberg Marx, who wrote One of the Lucky Ones. My story took place, my hidden childhood took place in Hungary. Uh, which was a relatively brief period of, t of horror when the Germans entered in March of uh, 1944. I was seven when I went into hiding. I walked with my mother on a beautiful sunny day in April, and she left me at the gate of the Ursuline convent with new documents which made me into a Catholic, a Catholic child. My uh, name was changed from Judith Grunfeld to Ilona Pop. I had to remember that I was no longer who I had been and certainly that I wasn't Jewish and I had to say goodbye to my parents. I thought only of the present. I'm not sure, could I say that it was a game? But I became someone 
I became someone else. I had no idea what had happened to my parents. In fact, my parents were taken to Bergen-Belsen. And eventually they left. They went from Bergen-Belsen to Switzerland. I was actually sent back to school. So I had quite a bit of time without my parents. This was the first time that I began to feel that I, I needed parents. And my parents did come back uh, in the fall. And I had this feeling that they were kind of strangers to me. I, I didn't feel comfortable. I really knew very little about Canada, except it sounded very romantic. It sounded like a, a very beautiful place. But actually, uh, we arrived in April. And April in Halifax is not exactly the most beautiful season. It was a little bit disappointing. But when we got to Montreal, we were received uh, very uh, generously by the uh, Jewish community of Montreal. And it was Passover. And so they organized a Seder for us at Moshe's Steakhouse. Being a Holocaust survivor wasn't exactly uh, a sign of, uh, of, uh, of social, high social value when we came to Canada. I mean, some people called us green, greenhorns and uh, DPs. My parents never really shared their problems with me, but of course, I, I knew that life was tough. In order for me to be a survivor, I had to separate myself from them. And that's not a very nice thing to think about right now, but it is a survivor survival technique. And I remember now my parents didn't dwell on their Bergen Belsen experience, but they did tell some stories. And somehow my mother always made the stories sound like um, she got the better of the experience. Was this to protect me or was this to protect herself? And I think uh, it, it was both. My mother had some major operations in uh, Switzerland after she was released from Bergen-Belsen. The doctor came to see her and said, uh, it's amazing how you managed to survive this. And she said, this is the reason why I survived it. And she pointed to my picture. And, you know, I said, no, 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 you know, I don't want to hear any more of this. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be responsible for your survival. But then it came to me that all this is, is is, is testimony to the fact to what a strong person she was and how genuine her love for me uh, was. I was always writing. I wrote poetry as a child and then eventually began to write short stories. But I've all, I always drew on my own life and particularly my childhood as the material of the stories. But I didn't necessarily think at that time that they would be important as witness stories. I think now that they are important. Uh, there are so many deniers of Holocaust and there are so, many ign so much ignorance in a larger sense. It's extremely important to sort of set it in the context of children being damaged, and children, not just Jewish children, also, but children in any war situation, which is the product of hatred. <laughs> 